Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. A lost sheep, a lost coin. And if we were to keep reading on in Luke chapter 15, we discovered there, there was a lost prodigal son and his equally lost older brother. Anyway, you look at it, Luke chapter 15 oozes with good news. Everything that was lost was found, and there was much rejoicing in heaven and on earth. I think the reason why we love these stories is because they are, it is so easy for us to see ourselves in them because they give us hope and peace and joy. These stories show us that God's capacity to find us is greater than our capacity to get lost. It's easy to love and trust a God like this. You know, unlike last Sunday where Jesus was teaching us this, that anyone who can't love or hate their family and even life itself, well, then they can't be his disciple. That was hard. The truth is, these grace-filled stories of Jesus were in fact very hard for the original hearers to accept, some Pharisees and scribes. For the third time, these folks had criticized Jesus for welcoming and eating with sinners, lepers, tax collectors, women of the night. These sinners, used to ridicule and invective from the Pharisees, well, they're spellbound by what Jesus, by how Jesus deals with them. Whatever Jesus has to say, they want to hear more. They draw near to Jesus, while these Pharisees and scribes, they stand back, choking on their wrath and their indignation. Living on this side of the cross and resurrection, it's hard to see what all the fuss is about. I mean, Jesus the Good Shepherd is simply just doing his job of tending to his flock, of, of the good doctor treating the sick, right? But would we all feel the same way if they weren't lepers, tax collectors, and hookers, but dirty bomb-toting terrorists, corrupt bankers and politicians and insurrectionists, bad people seen as, well, a dangerous threat to our well-being and our, of our country and society and family, our hopes and dreams, substitute in these characters for sinners, and we can begin to see why the Pharisees were furious with Jesus, why we might be furious with Jesus. Try and explain to others, children in particular, that we are supposed to have a, a close and personal relationship with Jesus, but when he hangs out with the very people that we teach them not to be like, it creates a horrible quandary where they, well, might get the wrong message. It's better to wander off than it is to stay put. And that heaven esteems good behavior less than the alleged repentance going on over at Jesus' dinner table. How do you tell kids, or anyone for that matter, something like that? It's like telling them to go off and get lost. I mean, it worked for St. Paul after all. By his own admission, he was a, a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. And yet Jesus sought him out and showed him great mercy, making him even to be an apostle. Of course, having seen the light, a penitent Paul proceeded then to go and eat with Gentiles everywhere. And despite the imprisonments and beatings, the character assassinations and the death threats, he persisted in seeking people out and sharing the good news. But then again, I think that's what Jesus' two parables are really about. They are not about lost sheep and lost coins, but about a persistent shepherd and a persistent woman who keeps searching and searching until they found what was lost. Which one of you, says Jesus, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them? He is not inviting the Pharisees and the scribes or us to imagine ourselves to be sheep, but shepherds, leaving our carefully tended flock in order to chase after the one that's wandered off. Now, suddenly, these stories sound totally different. Repentance, the amending of, of evil ways, is not so much the issue, not that sheep and coins could ever do that, as seeking and sweeping, finding and rejoicing. Jesus' parables are not so much about you being rescued, 
but about you joining Jesus in his mission of rounding up God's flock and recovering God's treasure, which we know is where God's heart is. These stories are about that Pharisee in all of our hearts, learning to question the idea that there are certain conditions or, or qualities that the lost must meet or display before we deem them eligible to be sought out and found. Jesus' parables are more about us trading in our lofty standards for a bright flashlight and a good broom and discovering the joys of finding. One of my favorite Christian authors, Barbara Brown Taylor, tells a story about how she and her husband Ed went on a 10-day hike in the wilderness with 15 other folks and a tour guide, none of whom they had ever met before. She wrote that as the days passed, it became apparent that all walkers are not created equal. Some charged ahead while others lagged behind. And uh, while they encouraged one another along the way, they quickly learned that they could only move as fast as their slowest member. Her name happened to be Karen. <laughs> Our Karen hikes, no problem. This Karen, well, <laughs> She was the eldest member of the group, the most physically ill-prepared, and also, well, the most unpleasant. <laughs> she liked to walk in the rear of the group, which was just as well, because she had this irritating habit of eavesdropping and then interrupting other people's conversations to correct them for their grammar or <laughs> geography and history, botany, or any other sort of subject about which she seemed to know so much. She liked a full hour for lunch and threatened to be sick if she were rushed. Most of their camping spots were either too sunny, too wet, or too steep. But she would plunk herself down anyway and announce that she would make do. <laughs> Around the fifth day, they got good and lost. Walking for close to, to 10 hours over three mountains before they finally made camp. When they arrived, after dark, in the rain, in the middle of nowhere, they discovered that Karen was nowhere to be found. They compared notes and discovered that no one had seen her since noon, when she had thrown rocks at the person assigned to bring up the rear of the group and told him to, quote, leave me alone. Delighted, he complied. <laughs> But that meant that no one had seen her for almost eight hours. They were all trembling with exhaustion and soaked to the bone. And no one could even begin to imagine going back up that last mountain to search for her. But it was the job of the trail guide, and so he did. Armed with hot soup, a jacket, and a first aid kit, he disappeared into the dark while the rest milled around trying not to think about what it would be like to be lost in the wilderness without a match or a map or a friend. They paced and dozed until close to midnight when Karen stumbled into the camp holding on to her shepherd. Those who had despised her at noon fell all over her in the dark, hugging her and welcoming her home, pressing mugs of hot chocolate into her hands and oatmeal cookies into her pockets. No one thought of to ask her if she was going to be a nicer person from now on or, or whether she had learned her lesson. They were too glad to have her back. Imagining her out there in the dark, they'd all felt more than a little lost themselves. So finding her was as good as being found. Karen acted rather nonchalant about the whole thing, but the next day, she was up and dressed in the first one on the trail before anyone else. And from that day forward, she was part of the flock. Not everybody's favorite member, but part of the flock. Maybe it was getting lost that changed her, though she denied being afraid at all during her ordeal. But then again, maybe it was just being found that did the trick. Maybe it was the group's welcome home that made the difference, that convinced her that she was part of the flock. But at any rate, it was hard to separate her repentance from the group's repentance, from the repentance and the rejoicing. They all kept better track of each other 
and through the end and thereon, and took turns walking with Karen, who surprised them by bursting into song one night and leading everyone in a, uh, a medley of camp songs. While I suppose that some people are predisposed to being shepherds and others lost sheep, I think the truth is we are all simultaneously sheep and shepherds, sinners and saints, lost and found. When I am working hard, so hard, at trying to find and stay found, it is difficult not to judge those who seem to capitalize on being lost. I wanted to believe that these people are not merely lost, but bad, dangerous people. Because then, well, then I can just write them off and save myself a whole lot of grief and frustration. It is so much easier to concentrate on good people the ones who want to be found, the ones who are busy finding others. And I think about heaven ignoring all those good folks in favor of one sinner who sheepishly says, sorry, and suddenly the whole idea of a rejoicing God is like a red sore throat. You just can't swallow. Then I hear someone behind me call me by my name, and a big brown hand reaches out and grabs me by the scruff of my neck, hoists me through the air, and puts me on a pair of nice, warm shoulders as the dawn breaks after a cold, dark night. And I am so discovered, I'm so surprised to discover that I was lost and so relieved to know that I am found that my heart feels like it's being broken into, being broken open, while somewhere way off, I hear the noisy, joyous noise of angels singing. Amen.